Hey, everybody. This is Peter Hafner, Certified Financial Planner and Certified Financial Fiduciary. And I wanted to create this short video today because there's a lot going on in the world right now. And the stock market has been in a bit of a slide for a little while right now. In fact, the S&P 500 got up to about its high for the year back at the end of July. It got up to 45.82. And as October 31st, it was down to 41.93. So that's about an 8% decline in the stock market, in the S&P 500, from its recent high in uh, July to now. And uh, when we think about what's going on in the world and add that to that, it can be disturbing. We've got the war in Ukraine continues to grind on. Now we've got a war in Israel, which is just looking uglier and uglier for everyone involved. We've got dysfunction in politics, in the government, uh, and there's a presidential election looming next year. So lots and lots for you to be thinking about, for you to be worried about. And what I want to do is I want to give you some context. I want to give you some uh, ability to discern this information, to understand uh, what's the right balls to keep our eyes on as far as our investments go and our financial planning. So the first thing I want you to understand is even though the S&P 500 is down 8% in the last couple of months, it's still up for the year. And I don't know if you all know that, but the S&P year to date is up over 9% year to date. So that's pretty powerful. But what you're probably looking at is your statements, right? You're looking at your 401ks, your IRAs, your brokerage statements, and you're saying, hey, Pete, I ain't up 9%. And you're probably not. And frankly, you probably shouldn't be because if you've got diversified portfolios, you don't just have the S&P 500. The real value of a diversified portfolio is when the markets go down, you don't go down as much as the markets do. And that worked to our advantage last year when we had our bear market. But also when the S&P 500 is going up, uh, it doesn't go up as fast also, unfortunately. Now, in part, that's because we've got the stock markets of other countries in our portfolios, which aren't doing as well as the United States is, but it's also because we've got bonds. And even though the stock market is up a pretty good amount this year, the bond markets are down. So just if you have stocks, if you have bonds in your portfolio along with your stocks, you can see that's going to be a drag on your portfolio performance relative to the performance of the S&P 500. OK, so that, that's the first thing I want you to understand. But ultimately, ultimately, stocks go up when the economy is good. Stocks go up when corporate profits are rising or, or maybe when the perception is they're expected to be rising. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today in more detail, because I came across an article from the Carson Group. Uh, in fact, the article is from uh, Sanyu Varghese, and we'll have it linked below so you can read the entire article if you like. And uh, the economy is doing really well. And I, I just don't think people really understand this. When I turn on the news, I don't see that the economy is doing well. I hear all the bad news that's going on. And this is particularly, I think this is particularly accentuated in an election year. And why is that? Because it doesn't matter who's in office and who the opposition is. What's happening is the, the party that's out of office wants to get into office. And what they do is they want to find problems they can point their fingers at and say, we will fix these problems, get us elected. And it's not Democrats and it's not Republicans. It's the party that's out of office. That's what they do. So what you're going to hear is you're going to hear about all the things the party out of office believes are wrong with the economy. And again, that's why I like this Carson group. And that's why I like these articles that they put out because they really go through and they show us the data and things are going really well right now with the economy, far better than you probably think they are. So let's walk through this article a little bit and see what is in fact going on. Earlier this year, expectations were for a mild recession in the second half of 23. And I know you all remember that. That's all we heard every time we turned on the TV this year. There is a recession coming. There was bank failures the beginning of the year. Um, there was worry that it would be a return to the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. But that was revised to a more optimistic outlook as time went by. And 
on the eve of the third quarter GDP release, expectations for growth in the economy had risen as high as 3.8%. Now, that's what we were expecting, but the actual reading blew past those expectations with the economy actually growing 4.9% in Q3. 4.9% versus the 3.8% that people were looking for. That is a big, big gain. That's a big, big overshoot. And that's actually after adjusting for inflation, believe it or not. So think about this. Real GDP growth has grown faster than the CBO projected. Uh, in fact, before what the CBO projected before the pandemic, so we're growing faster now than the CBO thought we would be growing before the pandemic took place. And the CBO also projected that the unemployment rate in 23 would be 4.4%. They thought it would be this high. It's actually lower at 3.8% now. So these are big key things going on in our economy that are much better than what we had expected. Now, keep in mind, the economy has grown more than expected in real terms uh, in face of three massive shocks that have shaken our economy. And these are, number one, the worldwide pandemic that killed millions of people. It also resulted in massive job losses and many, many businesses just going under, going out of business. There was an energy price shock that set inflation to the highest levels in 40 years. And historically, energy shocks have pushed the United States into recession over and over again, but it didn't happen this time. And then finally, we also had the most aggressive Fed tightening cycle since the early 1980s. So surging interest rates crushed the housing market in 22. That wasn't unexpected, but historically, housing downturns have preceded recessions but not this time. That's not what happened. So keep in mind, this great trajectory of economic growth was not a given, especially considering the scale of the shocks the economy has faced. And most other economies have really had a lot of trouble after COVID. They've had significant output loss relative to pre-pandemic expectations. Look at the Eurozone. Look at the whole world. Look at China. Look at emerging economies. Look how they've, com they've performed compared to the United States. The United States is the odd one out with output running above pre-pandemic expectations. So we've talked a bit about the economy. Let's talk about inflation. Uh, inflation has been even better. In fact, the inflation trajectory in the United States is a lot better than in most other places in the world. Despite pushing a lot more fiscal stimulus into the economy back during COVID, inflation in the U.S. is now running below a lot of other developed economies. And this chart shows core inflation and where various countries are with regard to it. And what you see is that the United States is the leader. You know, we have got the lowest inflation relative to Japan, Germany, Canada, Italy, United Kingdom, France, and so on. So inflation is not the problem here in the United States that it is around the world. And inflation has come down a lot from its peaks back in uh, 21 and early 22. What you might be wondering is, what's coming next? You know, if things are doing better than we thought, what can we expect in the future? Well, a big reason for GDP growth coming in close to 5% in Q3, which is really big, was because businesses rebuilt their stock inventories. In fact, they added 1.3 percentage points to the headline number for GDP by building back their inventories. But inventories can be volatile from quarter to quarter. So it helps to expand our horizon a little bit. And what's incredible is that the economy has grown faster than after the 2017-2019 pace of 2.8%. And over the last year, it's grown 2.9%. And over the last two quarters, it's grown 3.5%. These are all in real terms again after inflation. So that should give you an idea of the current underlying speed of the growth in this economy. So the engine powering this, 
there's two major components and they make up just over 60% of the economy. And this should help us think about what might be coming ahead for us. So first there's services consumption, then there's government spending. Services consumption represents 45% of the economy and it is running ahead of its pre-pandemic pace. Government spending represents 17% of the economy and it is also running strong. Now, more recently, housing has also gone from being a massive drag on the economy to a slightly positive contributor. And this is no surprise, right? Interest rates have come up. Everyone knows mortgage rates have come up. Of course, people are not buying houses in the way they used to buy houses. It's cooled the housing market. Residential investment contributed to GDP growth in the third quarter for the first time in 10 quarters. Okay, first time in a long time. And incredibly, that's come in the face of mortgage rates that are higher than 8% in some cases. And what's happening is that high mortgage rates are locking in a lot of homeowners into their homes. So the inventory of existing homes is low. Think supply and demand, right? And that's pushing a lot of potential home buyers into the new house market. This is boosting single family housing construction. And this dynamic, it's likely to continue even if housing doesn't contribute a lot to GDP going forward, it's unlikely to be a drag on the GDP as it was in 2022. And that's big. That's important. You need to understand this. You need to know this. So what's next for services spending and government spending? Well, stronger spending on services in the service economy uh, is a direct result of stronger incomes and it's stronger incomes across all workers in the economy. Overall, income growth is running around 5% right now. This is thanks to strong employment gains, strong hourly wage growth, and hours worked running similar to what it was pre-pandemic. Plus, household balance sheets are in really good shape. In fact, medium net worth rose 37% between 2019 and 2022. So households feel less urgency to save and solidify their balance sheets, unlike what happened after the stock market and housing, housing crash in 2008 during the financial crisis. Another tailwind that we've got is gas prices are falling. Nationwide, average gas prices have fallen from about $3.90 a gallon to $3.50 a gallon. Food inflation is also coming down. That's going to be a boost for the budgets in the households of the people of the United States, for all of us. Now, when it comes to the government, government spending, it's unlikely more money for non-defense gets authorized by Congress, given what's going on in Congress right now. That, that's pretty much a given, right? However, there's plenty left in the tank with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, the CHIPS Act, and IRA. In fact, only a fraction of the spending authorized that's already been authorized by Congress because of these various acts has been exercised to date. And there's more to come. And that's good. And defense spending rose by an annualized pace of 8% in the third quarter. This is the fastest pace since 2020, since the fourth quarter of 2020. Defense spending is currently just 3.6% of GDP and it's close to an all-time low. Look at this chart. And think about what's going on in the world. Don't you think it's likely that defense spending is going to have to rise based on world events? So let's talk about state and local government spending a little bit. State and local government spending makes up 11% of the economy. And this is a significant amount. Now, between 2020 and 2022, state and local governments cut back significantly on spending. They had to because of COVID. But they're starting to ramp up spending and investment. And this is likely to continue over the next few quarters. Um, sales taxes and property taxes, they're likely to remain strong if spending remains strong. And this is in sharp contrast to the post-financial crisis period when states struggled to cut back on spending for several years. We don't see that. We don't expect that. And what does this all mean for the Federal Reserve and interest rates? Well, there's two key pieces to how this data matters to the Fed. So we'll probably see 
the higher rates that we've got now stay higher for a longer period of time. That's, in fact, that's likely to continue that these rates will stay higher until we see some softness in the economic data. And softness is coming, okay? However, slower inflation will probably keep the Fed from raising rates further. Core inflation is measured by the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, clocked in at 2.4% in the third quarter. And that was softer than expected and the slowest pace since the end of 2020. Equity markets, they appear to be struggling, as we talked about in the beginning. The S&P 500 is down 8% from its high. So equity markets seem to be struggling. And a lot of this has to do with elevated interest rates. But ultimately, higher rates are mostly just reflecting the strong economy that we've been talking about. And that's really good news because ultimately it's increasing corporate profits or the expectation of increasing corporate profits that make the stock market go higher. And when the stock market goes higher, our investments go higher. And we're all just a lot happier, right? Right. So even though it's been a rough couple of months, um, and even though there's trouble in Israel right now in the Ukraine, and please check my video where I talked about Israel so you can see what we think about how that affects things, uh, I think the outlook is strong. You know, it's always darkest before the dawn, and it's been dark for a little while now. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're going to be seeing things as we go to the end of the year, I think we're going to be seeing things pick up and going into the next year, we should have a pretty strong year. In fact, there's another video I did where I talked about the uh, one year anniversary of the bull market and the first year of this new bull market really underperformed uh, all the other bull markets in, since 1950. So uh, it could be that next year is going to be a better performer. That's my story for today, folks. I hope you found it interesting. Please like and subscribe and feel free to share this with your friends and relatives. If you have topics you want us to cover, send us an email, service at hafnerfinancial.com. And that's it for today. I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day.